Thank you, Clive. And thank all of you. I am so appreciative of being the first speaker in this conference. This is my favorite place to come. I enjoy it a lot. I hope next time I'm here, I can visit the Gibraltar remains. After all, if Gibraltar comes back, the British Museum still holds Piltdown, so there's something, <laughs> something to see there. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I want to spend a couple minutes with thank yous, if you don't mind, because uh, a lot of what I want to do is based on my weird experience of being one of the oldest people in the profession nowadays. I know I am first. It's not because I'm youngest. And, uh, and this, uh, the question about the origins of Homo and ideas about the origins of Homo actually were addressed by three historic figures who it turns out I knew and visited and worked with. One is John Robinson, shown here. In 1967, I was a graduate student at the University of Illinois. To take my human anatomy, I couldn't take it in Champaign-Urbana because I didn't have an anatomy program. So I went to the University of Wisconsin to take it, where John Hawks is now, uh, it, it, because they had a good program, but also because they had John Robinson, who I dearly wanted to spend time with. And I did. And Robinson was a kind man because he put up with me. And I'm just trying to picture myself then yakking away, why did you say this? How could you say that? And he was just always just calm and <laughs> a good person to work with. Philip Tobias, who I met for the first time when I worked at the Transfer Museum in 19, uh, 1974. And it turned out that Tobias, who worked at the University of the Witwatersrand, or Witz, had never been there before. Although he lived in South Africa his entire life, he was a South African, he was a professor at, at Witz, but such were the bad feelings between Witz and Pretoria, not about politics, about Broom and Dark. Dark was at Witz, Broom was at uh, Pretoria. Broom would come over and look at things in Dark's lab and make notes on them and drawings on them and publish them in the annals of the Transvaal Museum without Dark's permission, which always left Dark fairly irritated. And, and the situation between the two institutions were very bad. So the very first time that Tobias came to, uh, to, to, the, uh, to Pretoria to work in the Transvaal Museum, I happened to be there, and that was sort of fun to watch. And of course, there's Louis Leakey. I, I, I was at the University of Illinois as a physics major. I graduated in physics and then went out in anthropology. My, my preferences and ideas of what I wanted to do had changed, and they had just hired uh, a new biological anthropologist who became my advisor, Gene Giles. And Gene, as part of his startup package, arranged for Louis Leakey to do a six-week seminar at the University of Illinois. So there it was. And I spent six weeks listening to him. But I'll tell you what I remember the most was this paper. I put it up there only to remind myself to talk about. It's a paper where, where Tobias and von Koningsweld had written about how Homo habilis fit in between Australopithecus and Homo erectus as a stage. Australopithecus, Homo habilis, and then Meganthropus from Java, and then Homo erectus from Java. And, and Leakey was furious about this. He didn't know the paper was coming, and he spent a lot of time talking about how mad he was that they published this paper without talking to him. And I think it drew him into, into a position he didn't even want. But it was fun to have Leakey, and it was fun to listen to what he said, because you get great insight by spending time with people. So I'm, I'm deeply indebted to them. And of course, I'm very deeply indebted to this group, these are my friends. They invited me here. It's my great pleasure, and I'm happy to be here. Also, I should say that scattered throughout the audience are a number of my students. And knowing that they would be here, listening intently, no, actually preparing to be bored, because they've already heard me talk about just about everything, I am giving a talk that they have not heard. The slides they, largely, slides they have not seen. And maybe, maybe, they, maybe they knew the ideas, but they haven't heard the talk. So. I thought I'd have some fun with this. So that's what I'm here to talk about. What I've been thinking about vis-a-vis -vis the origin of the genus Homo, and of course, the place of Neanderthals within that. Homo is a genus within the uh, subfamily Hominidae, but it's also a clade, it's also an adaptation, it's also a unique group. And it's because of these various ideas of what the Homo is that it's complicated to talk about the origin of Homo. Uh, although I think largely the complication is in how we use the term and how we might try to agree on why we should use the term about. So to clarify the way I'm using Homo, 
Let me turn to a group of special interest to the Freemasons. Birds. <laughs> In particular, what do I mean by Aves? Now, in this case, I can give you an answer. We talk about the origin of Aves. It's simple. It's dinosaurs. And dinosaurs give us a picture of the ancestral tradition because they are the sole ancestors of Aves. But it's more than that. Cladistically, Aves is a part of Dinosauria. Aves is a dinosaur group. Aves are dinosaurs. And the whole idea that dinosaurs became extinct is wrong, because they're still with us. They've had a great adaptive radiation. Well, I went to Google Images, which is, of course, the source of all knowledge, just to see <laughs> what people had been publishing about, about Aves with feathers. So I, just, I just looked on Theropod uh, feathered dinosaurs, and, and here's a, an example of a number of them. And they're good, and they find pigment. They don't, they don't just find feather remains, they find pigment in the feather remains. We have a very good idea of what many of the colors were. Surprisingly, they're as colorful as birds. I, get, I knew that early on, but I never knew what it meant. Now we know what it means. Now, fossil hominids have a relationship with fossils, with, with, with dinosaurs. In fact, they're very closely related. And it's beyond the fact that they keep on appearing in the same movies, cavemen and dinosaurs. They're the children's favorites. The fact is, is that books about paleontology, about dinosaurs, about cavemen, cave women, these are still the most popular books checked out of elementary school libraries. Kids love this stuff. There's more to it than that. Neanderthal, of course, has crept into our vocabulary. We, we call our, our politicians Neanderthals, probably for good reason, except it's a slight on Neanderthals who turn out to have been much smarter than people give them credit for. And the crazy thing is, is that many children can identify and name dinosaurs much more accurately than animals found in their own backyards. The reason I know this is as follows. When, when Rachel's and my children, uh, Ben and Sarah, Ben was seven and Sarah was three, and we were traveling across uh, Wyoming looking at some of the historic places where dinosaurs had been found. And we came across Bob Bakker, who's a dinosaur paleontologist. And Bob recognized me because I had been in his lab when I was doing my uh, PhD work. I went to Yale to look at stuff in David Pilbeam's lab, and I met Bob then. I had no memory of this. Little did I know that this was the beginning of what turns out to be a whole career in life of lost memories, because I just don't remember stuff very well. It's awful. <laughs> But, but he did, and he said, why don't you come to Rock Creek tomorrow, because there's a little museum there I built for the local people, and I'll give a talk to children. So we show up at this museum, uh, Rachel and I had the two kids, and Bob is talking and sketching and sketching and talking. And when he came to this sketch, he put it up, but he didn't name it, and he says, he's, he's talking here about the, about the proportions of the leg, trying to think about whether these things were running or walking efficiently or whatever. And, and it says, now, who could recognize what this is? And my son, Ben, here, Ben pops up and says, he gives a name. And I was flabbergasted. I mean, thinking, Ben could not recognize a groundhog. I mean, I think he could, he could recognize a skunk, because everyone recognizes skunks. But he doesn't know the names of animals around where we live. And he knew this thing, I had no idea. So Bob signed over the, uh, the, the picture to Ben, and we've kept it ever since. Here's what I know now. There's actually times in your life when you're a dinosaur expert. The first time is when you're four years old. The second time is when you get a paleontology degree, when you actually know something about them. The third time is when your kids are four years old. And although they left it off the chart, I put it on the chart. The fourth time is when your grandkids are four years old. <laughs> it all comes back. But the thing I've noticed about dinosaurs is every time it comes back, it's a whole different body of knowledge. It's changing very quickly. And that's very much like human evolution, too. So I, let's talk about this just for a few minutes. The fact is there's a lot of feathered dinosaurs, and they're not all birds. But all birds are feathered dinosaurs. Let's look at the phylogenetically, where we could look at birds. I'm not sure. When I do this, oops, that, that didn't go the way I wanted it. I got to go back here. Whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. One more, that's it. When I press this, ah, never mind, I'm not gonna do it. 
it doesn't show up anywhere but here. So birds are a clade of dinosaurs. They have longer arms. Their arms are especially long. They have a toothless beak. Shoes winged. Uh, digits are short and a feathered tail. And, 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 and these are characteristics which are cladistic characteristics. That's why we call them a clade. Phylogenetics has changed the traditional way we look at them. Birds as a dinosaur clade helps us reevaluate how we think about dinosaur extinction. What does it mean to be extinct? Dinosaurs don't seem to be. And there are adaptive trends within these feathered dinosaurs. One of them is a trend that leads to avias. But there's another really interesting trend that goes, takes place over 70 million years in China, where ancestral forms to your left become insect eaters. There's changes in the hand and the arm over time. The arms shorten, the hands are characterized by an enlarged finger, which is probably for digging in bark. And, and, uh, and, and, and they, were, were, they were highly specialized, I think quite pretty. So it's not just that dinosaurs led to birds. Dinosaurs led to many things. Dinosaurs are also an adaptive line. That is, they change their adaptation over time. And one of, on the clay leading to birds, birds don't appear suddenly, they appear gradually on that line. People can't decide, the reason I put this up is because it's about, we can't decide when they are birds and when they're not birds. We do think that what happened to them has to do with what happened to 65 million years ago. There was a bottleneck. And the surviving dinosaurs were, seems to have been ground-dwelling birds because the trees burnt after the cause of the bottleneck. With no trees, the, the birds that were nesting in trees had nowhere to nest, and the odds are that that's a large reason why they became extinct. The only reptiles, dinosaurs aren't reptiles, of course, they're warm-blooded. The only reptiles that lived through this were reptiles that were also ground dwelling or actually animals that burrowed. Now, using this as a way of thinking about it, what about the hominids? Did Homo begin gradually or did it begin with a bottleneck? Are we a delimited group? Are we a clade? Are we an evolutionary stage, an adaptive grade? These are, these are all ways of dealing with Homo. They don't necessarily contradict each other, but their criteria are certainly different and how they work in understanding evolution is different. And that's what I want to talk about today. These are complex problems. When do we have the earliest evidence of Homo? And if you think we do, why, why is it Homo? Does the appearance of Homo reflect a gradual change or a rapid change at, the, at a speciation? Can the clade be defined by shared unique features, autapomorphies, if you like that, uh, if you like that way of dealing with it, or is it described by evolutionary trends throughout its history? To get at this, I'm going to break this down into three problems. And this is pretty much the structure of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to start by talking about behavioral evidence of adaptive change at the origin of Homo. In the modern era, that is, in the 20th century, the beginning of Homo, the beginning of Homo is the beginning of Homo habilis. Homo habilis was really defined on, on behavior. It's the main criterion that people used although they, and morphology was taken into account, of course. But, but the remains were fragmentary. And what was exciting about Homo habilis is that it was the earliest hominid found with tools on f living floors or camps, if you will, where there was organization. And this was so human-like and so unlike Australopithecines, which at that time were only known from South Africa and were never found with tools that the people were quite excited about this, and it led to a number of publications about Homo habilis. Habilis, by the way, was Dart's idea. Homo habilis means handyman. And being handy, I will point out, is a behavior. It didn't say brainy man. It didn't say man with great dexterity. It, it was about handiness. So this is the first publication. It's a 1964 publication. And, and basically, what th this was written by Leakey, Tobias, and Napier. And their main point was that this was a new species of hominid found in between Australopithecus and Homo erectus. And in terms of what it was like, it was more like Homo erectus because it behaved more like Homo erectus. This is their summary. We've come to the conclusion that apart from uh, uh, Australopithecus or Zygianthropus, the specimens we are dealing with from bed one and the lower part of bed two at Oloid represent the genus Homo, and it's not an Australopithecine. 
The species is clearly distinct from previous species that we've described. Leaky Tobias and Napier. But there was another player, and that was a South African paleontologist, John Robinson. And Robinson wrote that the bed one material may represent an, an advanced form of Australopithecus, and the bed two specimens higher up an early Homo erectus, and at the same time, the latter could be a lineal descendant of the former. If that sounds like what you just heard from Leakey, Tobias, and Napier, it's because it is what you just heard, but they didn't see it that way. Tobias wrote a response to this. Well, the Homo habilis fossils represent a form intermediate between Africanus and Erectus. It was like this. You had these two young paleoanthropologists, and they were fighting each other. But it was a distinction, I think, without a difference. In fact, when Tobias laid out what he meant in the stratigraphy, it's exactly the way we would describe it today. Australopithecus was earlier, Homo erectus was later, and Homo habilis was in between them. But there's also truth to what Robinson said. The later specimens of Homo habilis, the, bed, the upper bed two specimens above the break, were, were much more like Homo erectus than the earlier specimens were. Well, Robinson went on with this because he had a little bit more to say. Uh, he, he put everything he thought into a 1967 paper, and it's really the last paper he published on this, because after this, he moved to the States. He established himself as a teacher at University of Wisconsin. You see why John Hawks was in Wisconsin. He's, there's a long tradition of paleoanthropology there. And then he had a heart attack, and he was out of it totally. So the last thing he published was in 1972. It was, uh, he did a monograph on all the postcranial remains from Sturkfontein and Smart Friends. Chrome Dry and Macapen. Anyway, so what, what the, the thinking here was that if you put this together correctly, it does make evolutionary sense. That would be the best way to say it. And that had a lot of influence on me in a paper I published much later. I didn't realize it at the time. I, a lot of these things I realize much better when I'm older and go back and look at not just what I wrote, but what other people were writing too. Robinson wrote, if variation is properly taken into account and due attention is paid to the diagnostic criteria, the obvious conclusion appears to be that the hominids are not a taxonomically diverse group. The group seems to be made up of two major lineages. One was robust Australopithecines, and the other was Homo. The progressive line was adapted to its environment in a manner that involved culture as a very prominent part of the adaptation. This line includes Australopithecus and Homo. And since it's a line occupying one single adaptive zone, I consider it reasonable to use a single generic name for it, and this would have to be Homo. My point here is only one thing, and that is Robinson was placing the gracile Australopithecines in Homo, along with Homo habilis. He also thought that they were hunters, scavengers, omnivores. He wrote all that about them. He wrote a description which would fit Homo habilis as well as it would fit the, the, these Australopithecines. So I accept this as a starting point, a starting point for our discussion of Homo. I'll return to it. But I do want to point this out. Robinson was an excellent anatomist. He was a fine paleontologist. He knew what he was doing and when he sunk Australopithecus into Homo. But his reason for doing it was exclusively cultural. And behavioral, as I said. Now we know more about what happened during this time period. And I think one of the main things we can see is besides this cultural evidence, the other thing that was happening is that there were ecological changes taking place across East Africa. And some of what happened as Homo originated were dietary changes. In many parts of Africa, there was a change from closed to open habitats. Grasses spread further. It became drier. And all these were ecological changes that, that the emerging hominids took advantage of. By two and a half million years ago, uh, the environment had become really arid across many places, and the, there were lots of seafloor dominated areas. As the rainfall belts actually contracted, and that seems to have been a response to the cooling in the north and the uh, high altitude ice. The distribution of moisture changed. The consequence of it was hominids developed dietary adaptations, some of which were mixed C3 and C4 adaptations that would be true of the Australopithecines in southern Africa. But there also were some C4 uh, evolving hominids. And the main one we know is, uh, is Zygianthropus, or Australopithecus boisei. I like that better, actually. But that, whatever you want to call it, it was this megadont hominid from eastern Africa. I'm comparing it to one of his contemporaries, and it's 
it's a pretty big difference uh, between these two. And it's clearly a C4 eater. This, this has come out of every study that they've done with these big megadot Australopithecines. But we're C4 eaters too. I'll just remind you that we've eaten C4 uh, through our evolution, and you might have eaten some this morning because we eat all these cereal grains. So it's not just robust Australopithecines that are C4 eaters. We just don't have their adaptation because we do all this preparation outside of the mouth, not in the mouth. Meat was also an important component of C4 because animals that eat grasses are, provide C4 signatures in, in, in whatever eats the animals. So did hominid meat eating involve hunting or scavenging? Henry Bunn, a University of Wisconsin. Oh, why am I doing this to the University of Wisconsin? I mean, they're not as good as we are in Michigan, but they're pretty good. <laughs> and and no, Henry, had a, Henry had a good line on this, and this is a line I like a lot. He says, uh, for all the animals we looked at, we found a completely different pattern of meat preference between ancient humans and other carnivores, indicating that the hominids were not just scavenging from lions and leopards and taking their leftovers. If they were, there should be the same signature. If they weren't, there's a different signature there. His point was that the early hominids were picking what they wanted and killing it themselves. So it's part of what happened. And there's good evidence for that in bed one all over the gorge, where the Homo habilis remains are found. So where are we? This brings us to tool making and tool use. From the time of man the tool maker, and notice I put that in quotes, using and making stone tools was considered the key attribute of becoming human, if not its cause. This was firmly believed by Kenneth Oakley, by Louis Leakey, and by many other paleoanthropologists who just happened to be men. I'm sure it was coincidence. I don't think it's coincidence that's that being sarcastic, okay? Because what I think is that, as Mao said, women hold up half the world. Thank you, Karen. And women's adaptation is a part of the human adaptation, and women are probably procuring, procuring food by other means, means that are complex, means that involve tools, means that involve sharing, but means that don't mean killing animals. OK, Homo habilis here is, is, is probably the best example of, of an early Homo habilis find is all the way hominid seven. It's a kid, uh, they, it's 1.85 million years, and there's a hand associated with it. And, and, and the hand itself is an indication that Homo habilis was adapted to tool making. And I'll talk for, I'll, I'll give you a little detail on this, but not this second. It has to do with these thick terminal phalanges, the fingertips. They're broad, they're thick, and they're really good for gripping. It also has an expanded brain size compared to Australopithecus. And it really sort of anatomically fit what you would want an early tool maker to look like if you think that brains and hands were important in their evolution. Tools were not found with the South African Australopithecines until much later. Um, these are some tools from Sturkfontein. They have a sort of wishy-washy date of 2.2 million years old. They could well be too late to belong to the Sturkfontein Australopithecines. But that turns out not to be important. Today, the most important thing we know is, is that stone tool making predates Sturkfontein. The question of whether the Sturkfontein hominids can be associated with stone tools is moot because, thank you, Tom, we have earlier stone tools from East Africa that are securely dated and which tell us that hominids were making stone tools before Sturkfontein was inhabited. These Lomquian tools, the earliest of which are now 3.3 million years old, listen, I'm a student of Binford and I believe every time I say the earliest, an alarm better go off because nothing will permanently be the earliest, I guess, except maybe the earliest moment in the universe. Whenever we find the earliest, we are bound, someone is bound to find an earlier. But at the moment, as far as I know, and I bet I'll be corrected, I can imagine by whom, uh, the, these are the earliest stone tools I know of. And I doubt they're the first ones. And let me tell you why. Here is a scattering of the tools from Lone Kui 3, the site w which is dated at 3.3 million years old. And here's a scattering of tools made, known to be made by chimpanzees. Now, I'm not going to do tool taxonomy. And if I did, I wouldn't use it to say, hey, these tools were probably made by the same thing, because that's crazy. It, it just doesn't happen that way. But to me, the skill level and the perception of, you know, of thinking about what to make and how to shape it 
And these chimpanzee tools and these lone queen tools are real similar. Now, you know that the chimps were not holding, uh, were not holding rocks the way we do. Their grip only, does not involve the thumb, which is much shorter. It involves only the four fingers. And they grip in this sort of transverse manner, holding things between their fingertips and their palm. But this seemed to be good enough to hold them, enough to flake them, because the chimps were flaking stone tools. The lone plea tools don't look like they involve a different sort of skill set. And for me, the null hypothesis in my mind is that Stone tool making, not just use, but stone tool making is a homology between early hominids and chimpanzees, which means we would expect to find it in the last common ancestor of hominids and chimpanzees. And, you know, we don't know where that last common ancestor is. It could be a long, long time ago. I think the odds are it's not a long, long time before this. I think it could be a million or perhaps two million years before Lomqui. The evidence for beyond five million years, I think, is poor. And the evidence for under 4 million years is probably pretty poor, too. So even though all those have been claimed for when the divergence of humans and chimpanzees took place, I'm thinking that the, 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 we're, we're around that time. And it's not incredible in my mind to think that stone tool making could be homologous between these two very closely related primates. That's certainly what I'm getting out of this. So we wiped the whole stone tool model out of the origin of Homo. Early homo evolved using stone tools, but it didn't evolve because of stone tools, because stone tools were used by its ancestors, as well as its more ancient ancestors, as well as common ancestors of chimpanzees and hominids. That's what this means. OK, phonetic evidence of homo-like anatomy. Continuing the discussion of the ramifications of stone tool making, there's some anatomical evidence that supports Robinson's interpretation that the Sterkfontein species belongs in homo. I'm going to only discuss two things. I'm not going to make you crazy. One of them is newly evolved hand strength. So I started this already. Chimpanzee hands differ in a number of ways from hominid hands, but an important one is that in the chimps, ah, OK, this is not working well for me. I will stop using the red the dot totally. In the chimps, the distal phalanges are thin. The apical tufts at the end of the distal phalanges are shows it here, these, these, these are not large. This is what's underneath your fingernail. These are narrow. Your fingertips are narrow. And hominid hands, they're thick, and the apical tufts are expanded. They have a much more powerful grip between their fingers. That did not happen at the beginning of hominids. In fact, Australopithecus afarensis, which is the direct ancestor of the Sturkfontein hominids, afarensis is just older, but otherwise fairly similar, but not similar in the hand. Afarensis has thin distal phalanges. There it is, comparing it here to a Neanderthal hand. This is a powerful grip. This is a weak grip. Now, that doesn't mean that chimpanzees had weak hands. We know that they could hang from trees. We know that they could brachiate. They did a lot of things with their hands. It's the way they're strong that's important. And looking at that comes from a really nice paper written by Mark Skinner, which I'm going to talk about. First, just let me show you this. These are terminal phalanges from Hadar. Here's an Ardipithecus terminal phalange. They're very much like chimpanzees. And here are three terminal phalanges that I'm interested in. One is from Sturkfontein, SCW-294. It's big and it's thick, and it's got that big apical tuft. One is Homo habilis, the, the old way seven hand. There's a thumbed phalange. It's big and it's thick with a big apical tuft. And there's one from Swartkrans, which is interesting only because we don't know who it belongs to. Swartkrans has evidence of Homo in it. Could be a robust Australopithecine. I'm not saying it isn't. But it could also be homo, because homo remains are found in smart grants. We can't deal with what it is. But we do see that there are these changes that take place in the hominids themselves. Hominids didn't begin with thick, powerful apical tufts on their fingertips. This is a Skinner paper. I like this paper a lot. Here he's showing a series of scans of chimp, Africanus, some robust Australopithecines are homo and a living human. And what he's pointing to here is a difference in the distribution of, of, of internal spongy bone and of thick compact bone. And it's quite different. The strength characteristics of the hand is different. These, as well as these, although we don't know who they are in Homo, these are the similar ones. So let's talk for a minute about what this means. Here's, here's his model. And he, he thinks about a chimpanzee 
with an arboreal grip, and he's looking there at the thumb in the second digit, holding onto a branch, where the force is going to be mostly here, because the weight of the animal is below. Or in knuckle walking, where it was a totally different use of the hand, and in knuckle walking, uh, there is force, on, on, there's more, much more direct force on the first metacarpal, but it's in, it's, it's in a loading direction along the axis, let me put it like that. Or in this use, where you hold the stone tool between your thumb and your fingers. This is the one where you're using that grip that you're good at because you have thick of, of terminal phalanges. This is the one where you use that strength. And that, when you're holding it like that, the force isn't going down the finger bones, it's going transverse to the finger bones. It's stressing them differently. So that's what, that's what Skinner thought about when, when he wrote this very nice paper, I have to say. And uh, the loading pattern looks like this, because he you could tell the loading pattern by the distribution of, of compact bone. The loading pattern in pan is on both ends, and it, it's very thick, and it's, it, it's resisting force really well, but it's not resisting force the way the hominids do. All of these, Africanus, Neanderthals, and, and early Homo sapiens, they all have most of their loading here, because that's where the muscles are holding the fingers steady, because the force is acting not along the bone, but transverse to along the bone. And the, the bone is in position and exerting force because of the ligaments and uh, tendons between the finger bones, and it affects the bone, especially here. So my conclusion on that one is that at some point, at the time of Sturckfontein, maybe a little earlier, but we don't see it earlier than Sturckfontein, hominid hand morphology changed. And that change, I think, is a response to using the hands more often and more effectively in tool making. The other thing I want to look at is evidence of a slower rate of maturation. We humans take longer to grow up than chimpanzees, period. We're sexually mature, 16, 17, 18 years old, occasionally earlier. I mean, we, there, there's billions of us now. You could probably find anything if you look for one. But, but in terms of, of modal or mean sexual maturity, we become mature a good five to seven years later than chimpanzees do. Our third molars come in inevitably late. Our third molars, which really mark the end of growth, our third molars come in at 18, 20, Maybe they don't come in at all. My third molars are still sitting in their crypts. Um, if, if you look at people who erupt their third molars and ask what their average is, it's in the 20s. If you work this out for Neanderthals or any other recent fossil, third molar eruption is 16, 17 years old. That's what I usually find in this for Australopithecus. In chimps, the third molars are at 9 or 10. And that is a real marker of the childhood length. But, and I'll say this several times to remind you of it, it's not like an accordion where you just make everything longer. What happens is early childhood in, in, in chimpanzees and humans today is pretty similar in the timing of events. But as you get into what people call middle childhood, when the premolars and the second molars start erupting, it starts getting longer in humans. And it's much longer between the second molar and the third molar. Or in the case of chimps, the second molar and the third molar or the canine, because the canine erupts very late in chimps. That's short in chimps, that's long in humans. So this was worked out, I think, pretty well by Alan Mann. But he went to South Africa in 1968. There's Alan when he was young. I bet you most of you wouldn't even recognize him because he doesn't look like this anymore. Anyway, uh, he worked out the rate of dental eruption in South Africa. That's what his dissertation was about. But he could only do it at smart class because there were no mixed dentitions at Sturckfontein. And for what Alan did, you needed a mixed dentition. You had to have specimens where there were some permanent teeth erupted or erupting and some deciduous teeth left. And at the time, Sturckfontein had none like that. But now 30 years later, more than 30 years, but 30 years later, in 1998, and the first specimen was published from Sturckfontein that had a mixed dentition. And in this case, I'm just going to use my hand so I don't muck everything up. In this case, there's two deciduous, uh, deciduous first molar, deciduous second molar, deciduous canine. These are the baby teeth. Here's the first permanent molar. There's a second permanent molar in the crypt. These incisors are erupted. The central incisors are erupted. <coughs> and the lateral incisors are 
They're erupting. They're, they're pushing their way through. They wouldn't be through the gum if it was a living specimen. That's a lot of information. It's enough information to say that on a sort of human scale, which I think works for these characters, and I'll show you why in a second, it's seven or eight years old. That's, that's pretty much what they expect at that age. Looking at it carefully, in fact, the first molar, the first permanent molar, is mainly worn on its front surface, which means while it was poked through the gum and it was literally erupted, if you were a dentist scoring eruption of the first molar, you check mark, it's erupted. But it really wasn't fully erupted because most of the wear is up here in front. And that's the way the tooth erupts. It erupts like a ship coming down, up or down or whatever, like a submarine coming up. The, the, the bow comes up first and then the stern follows, so it's something like that. And, and this one is just erupting up in front. So we're pretty good about, uh, about this specimen. So let's look for a second at eruption. I don't want, this gets a little in the weeds and it's not the only time I'm gonna do this, but I think it's worth doing just a bit of. Here's an eight-year-old human that's got those three deciduous teeth in. It's got the permanent incisors, central incisors are in, the lateral incisors are erupting. The first molar, which is here, is erupted, and the roots aren't closed yet. The second molar is in its crypt, and there's a little root starting. That's exactly the condition of this Sturckfontein specimen, 151. Canine, excuse me, the incisors, the lateral incisors, the three deciduous teeth, the first molars have a little wear, have a little, uh, the first molars are in, and the roots are open. The second molars just have a little root on them. But it's the human pattern. And I'll show you exactly how the chimpanzee pattern differs. It mainly differs here, in the third mole. So here in the pan, to get to fit this in pan, you, you're looking at a six-year-old, not an eight-year-old. Central incisors, lateral incisors, the three deciduous teeth, the first mole is in, and, and the roots are open. Now, all that part's the same. It's, it's two years earlier. But it's a good idea of how pan differs from humans. When you get to the second molar, however, there's a lot of root. And Pan, unlike the humans, has a third molar, uninterrupted. No human and no Australopithecus in this condition will have a third molar. It's not because they're lost, it's because they're not there, they haven't started developing yet. Remember, it's the latter part of the sequence that's extended. And that tells us about why it's extended. Because they're not spending a long time at, at their mother's side. They're not spending a long time as a kindergartner, they're spending a long time as one of these unruly adolescents. And what they're doing is they're practicing being adult members of their society, but they're not adults yet, so they can get away with it. When they blunder, some big alpha male doesn't come and bite their hand off. They're just treated kindly because they're kids. That's what this is about. And this is there in Australopithecus africanus. It's the earliest we find it in hominids. Okay, the third thing I want to look at is phylogeny. Phylogenetically, what about the evidence of cladogenesis? of speciation, and how does that affect our understanding of the origin of Homo? Well, let me go back to this. This is a nice paper done by Serling and his colleagues in, in PNAS in 2013, and what he's looking at are dietary differences between lineages, and, and he's got this lineage here of East African robust Australopithecines. That's the easiest way to think about them. Uh, these are the C4 eaters. He's got a Homo lineage. Don't name the species because we can't decide what it is. And they diverge, and they clearly are diverged by two and a half million years ago. There it is. It looks like a cladogenesis. It doesn't show a cladogenesis. It shows the results of a cladogenesis. So the question is, is if you've got this sort of model of what could have happened, what's the actual evidence on the ground at two and a half million years ago? And here's my answer. It is this lovely specimen published by number three student, and, and As 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 Aswa Brahani, his student, and some other folks I know actually pretty well, the Gari skull. It is not a complete skull, but here's the way they put it together. I think it's a very important specimen. It's from Eastern Africa. It is very well dated at 2.5 million years ago. If you like to make up evolutionary pictures, here's an evolutionary picture. Earlier than Gari, more than a half million years earlier, is Australopithecus afarensis. Here's Gari at two and a half million years, and here's one of his contemporaries right down the road at Lomqui, where those tools are found. I'm not saying that this is a tool maker. I'm just saying it's found, uh, it's found in the Lomqui area. This is the so-called black skull. It's called the black skull not because Alan Walker was a racist. It's called the black skull because, as you can see, it's black. It's very hard to photograph, in fact. It's so dark. 
Uh, and, and this is a sequence which I don't think is, um, I don't think people think this is a crazy sequence. There's a lot of similarity between these, but it certainly looks like these two are the beginning of evolution in different directions. Had ours the ancestral condition, the prognathism, the superorbital area, the size and shape of the cranium itself, uh, the nose, it's real similar. Uh, the biggest difference I find are the things about this robust australopithecine that are related to powerful chewing. It's got the roots of very large molars. Its cheeks are very thick. This is the bottom of the cheek. It's got other adaptations that reflect having large masculatory muscles. So I I'm happy with this as a different kind of thing in the process of becoming more different yet. And that's what lineages are. Gary is a contemporary of the black skull. If there's two lineages, they probably evolved from Aferensis. And my question is, is one of them homo? Well, I don't think that this robust lineage is homo. This is the robust lineage of two and a half million years, and here it is at 1.8 million years. This is a divergent lineage with a larger brain, increased jaws and, and post-canine teeth. There's reduction in the canines and incisors. The face is more vertical. The nuchal area is reduced. It's not as big. It's a very large nuchal area back here. And there's a change in the angulation of the cranial base. I mean, these are things that happen. This, this lineage evolves, is what I mean. And it doesn't evolve the same way as the other lineages, except both of these lineages increase their brain size. It tells you something about their adaptation. The other clade, I believe, is homo. Let's start here. Gary was found near stone tools. Here's some of the stone tools that's found there, and animal bones with cut marks. Gary was attributed to Australopithecus, and I don't think that's unreasonable, given the 2.5 million year old date and a very small brain size estimated for it. As, as an Australopithecus, however, it's the same age as a Sturckfontein Australopithecus sample. Let's look at this a little more carefully, because the question I have is whether Gary is the same creature or the same hominid that Sturckfontein is. Well, you say, no, 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 they're too far apart. Well, they're far apart. Here's Gary, here's Sturckfontein. It's most of the African continent apart. But they do have similar ages, and there's a sort of prima facie similarity between them. I think there's a null hypothesis here, and, and I would criticize my number three student for not testing it well. And the null hypothesis is the hypothesis of no difference, that Gary is a Sturckfontein-like hominid. Whatever we think Sturckfontein is, Gary probably should be the same thing. One reason to think this is it's not difficult to find specimens which are very similar. For instance, here's the Gary as reconstructed by number three student and Brahani Aswell, and here's Sturckfontein 252, uh, reconstructed by Ron Clark. You can see, I mean, this the plaster is the plaster is white, so the bone itself is very little of these specimens. But they did manage to reconstruct them in similar ways, and I don't think they did it because somehow um, Ron Clark was under control of Tim White who hadn't yet reconstructed Gary. And this is too much to think this. They, they did this independently. More to the point, they're complete dentitions and palates, and these are real similar to each other. The post-canine teeth are very, very large. Notice that the premolars are, are broader than the molars. They're very large teeth in both the you know, 252 and Gary. And the, the canines are also immense. This, this morphology later in the robust Australopithecines is associated with small canines. Here it's associated with huge ones. So without going crazy about this, I want to make the case that there's similarity between them. And in fact, if you start looking more broadly at Sturckfontein, which of course has much more variation than 252, it seems to me that there's a good case that Gary fits within the Sturckfontein sample. Here, and I'll, you know, I hope you're taking notes, there'll be a quiz on the way out. Here are the most complete Sturckfontein crania. I didn't label them just so you wouldn't try to learn them. I don't want that to happen. But my point is there's a lot of variation at Sturckfontein, and yet if I put Gary in here, it fits. It doesn't stand out as some crazy different thing. Now, I have to get a bit in the weeds, and I apologize for this. But I want to make the case. So in the weeds we go. If we wanted to formally refute the null hypothesis, the Brahani, the, the Aswa et al. paper, the Gary paper, gives us enough information to do it. They were very good about this. They gave us a list of characteristics that Gary has, 
and the condition of those characteristics in Gary, for instance, uh, the, the, the anterior pillars are absent in afarensis, absent in Gari, absent in early homo, present in Africans. You see what they're doing here. So all the things they could find in Gari, they also scored in these other groups. I'm glad they did, because I can work with that. They and all make 39 comparisons of Gari and A. Africanus, which is all I care about. I don't care about those other comparisons. This is the one I'm interested in because of the knock hypothesis. Of those 39 comparisons, eight say there's difference between them. And by difference, I mean they say there's different conditions. If they say that efferent, if they say that Gari has a thick superorbital torus and, uh, and the superorbital torus is variable in Africanus, I don't count that as different. I want, I want them to score them differently to count them as differences. There's only eight of those. And I'm going to show you what they are here, just in groups. So in this case, it'd be the diastema between the upper incisor and the canine. Uh, it's definitely there in Gari. There it is. And it's definitely there in 252. You can see the gap between the canine and the upper lateral incisor. Or here there's two things. One of the anterior pillars. These are anterior pillars in Sturckfontein. They're big, thick. They happen to be the canine roots, and they, and they form the sides of the nose. And that's common at Sturckfontein. Here, the anterior pillars and Gary are much more lateral. And uh, not only don't they form the sides of the nose, the sides of the nose are actually underneath the, the uh, lateral incisors. But here is a Sturckfontein specimen, 252, which is like Gary, in the anterior pillars being lateral, and the uh, canine, the, the, the sides of the nose are right over the lateral incisor. Did I do both of those? No, I didn't. Yeah, I did. I did both of those. Uh, there's a clivus contour, which is important. So here, going to number three student's anatomy book, the clivus is this part of your palate, it's the front of your palate here. And he's looking at the shape of the surface of the clivus. And he points out that the surface of the clivus here in Gari is convex, like this. But, but here's an australopithecine. Now, this is Ryan Clark's best picture of his australopithecine. He doesn't want it in focus, so we won't have it in focus. But there's enough to see that it's convex here, too. Or the separation of the vomer and the septal insertion. This is hard, so I'm going to show you this in another slide. This was actually Robinson's idea. Your vomer is a bone that starts in your cranial base and extends up into your nose. And in your nose, there's a place where the cartilage uh, that's in the middle of your nose inserts right into the vomer. So in the human condition, the vomer, which is this stipple thing, this is Robinson's drawing, it comes all the way out to the edge of your nose and the cartilage inserts into it. In the condition, in Sturckfontein, the normal condition, it looks like this, where the, the vomer is well behind the tip of the nose. There's a gap between the tip of the nose and where the cartilage is. And that's what, that's what uh, Professor White's writing about. And so here, at, at for SCS 52, this, this maxilla, looking at it down into the nose, you can actually see, if you know what you're looking for, the tip of the vomer, and it's well behind. Here's the nasal spine, here's the tip of the vomer. This is the condition he attributes to uh, Gary, where the vomer is behind the tip of the nose, not at it. It indicates that if there's an external nose, like ours, that's prominent in front of the face, it's not very big. If these australopithecines, it's not very big in Gary. That's what he's talking about. Oh, no, I'm doing it the wrong place. OK. Whoop. I think I wrecked myself here. OK, next, the frontal trigone. The frontal trigone is, is, is a trigone is a triangle, and there, there's several frontal trigones. The one he's talking about is if you look at the temporal lines coming up like this, and the superorbitals here, the area between them is triangular shaped and shallow. And here's a frontal trigone in Gari. It's big, and it's shallow, and it's triangular shaped. Tim forgot about this specimen, STS-17, where you can even see it better. Here's a superorbital. Here's the temporal line, and you can actually see, I took a good picture here, it's, it's, it's shallow, it's concave. This is a frontal trigone. So frontal trigones do not separate them. Another thing he talked about is the anterior convergence of the temporal lines. So the temporal lines are coming together, not far in the back of the skull, but up here. Here in STS-17, they're even more anterior. This is the midline of the thing. This is right here's where the midline is. And the temporal line surely would have had a sagittal crest there. And finally, the sagittal crest. There surely was one on 17. You can't see it. 
a better place to look for a sagittal crest is here at the back of Macapaz Gat 1, where you're looking at the occiput, and here's the temporal lines coming together, coming together, coming together. What do you think would happen if there was another centimeter of skull? I mean, there's no place for these to go except to form a sagittal crest. So, yeah, he's right. You don't see a sagittal crest, but you can infer it on several specimens. Uh, we're almost done with this. Costa superorbitalis, they describe as a orang-like structure arching out from the bulging, the bulging region where glabella is, right, in between the superorbitals, as a thin bar of bone covering the orbit. I mean, I'm showing it to you on this australopithecine because it's exactly the same as Gary. So what do I have to say about this is not one of the eight characteristics that they said were different are actually different. And I'm not going to tell you why, because I have absolutely no idea. I really talked to Tim. I have 24 students. There's one I really talked to. The others are friends, or in the case of all the ones here, very good friends. And so I never wanted to be like Washburn, where all my students hated me. But I guess I, I'm not a saint. And there's one student that doesn't like me much, so I don't talk to him. But I'm surprised about this, in a way. Because it just was not looking at enough variation in Stirk-Fontaine to come to these conclusions. So what I'm saying is that you can't disprove the null hypothesis, but guess what? That's what their publication said. Here is the lines of Agari and of A. Africanus. And notice they have them complete at the point of divergence. They're, similar, they're the same, and they only diverge later. So they're saying the same thing I'm saying, is that these are the same thing. They just didn't say it in print, but they showed it in their drawing. So how about the Gari postcranium? Can we work with these? And the answer is, yeah, we can. Gari has postcranium. There is a specimen uh, which is not the same specimen as the cranium that's found in Gari. So let me just say quickly what I think about postcranium. In the fossil record from the lower Pleistocene and Pliocene, there are basically two anatomical forms, which I could call later and earlier. The latest one is this, the Turkana boy, who's absolutely uh, homo and some kind of, if you like homo erectus, you would call it homo erectus. For sure, it's big, it's tall, it's strided, it has different anatomy. All the other ones are like, I'm gonna use the most complete one here, STW277, uh, 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 I'm sorry, 573. This is Littlefoot. But Littlefoot turned out to be more than a little foot, it turned out to be a complete skeleton. And the way these australopithecines, or early hominids, if you will, differ from later homo, is basically that they've got a more, a stronger shoulder complex, more powerful arms, and especially longer forearms. So if I could say that another way, they climbed more. I wouldn't make anything more out of that until we discover more about it. Here, here's a direct comparison of 573 and this early homo. It's all about the shoulder and the forearm. So, Here's how they published it, and they published the three bones, the, the three pieces, I should say, the upper arm, the lower arm, and then the femur, showing differences in proportion. But notice that the problem is, is that all these bones are reconstructed. So in all cases, you're guessing in what these differences are. And a, a subgroup of the original publishers, Reno and colleagues here, published a paper later talking about the proportions of a lot of early hominids, uh, with estimates based on how much is reconstructed. So all the way 62, which is a homo habilis, has so much reconstructed that this is a humeral femoral index, how long is the humerus compared to the femur, and it could be anything. So they put Gary here, where I would say it was very homo-like in the length of the humerus compared to the femur. But in terms of the length of the lower arm compared to the upper arm, Gary's different. Gary is much bigger than homo like an australopithecine, not like Homo at all. And Gary seems to be, in my mind, on the climbing end of this difference in postcranial remains. And that's what this says. So, it's Dirk Fontaine, Gary, they're far apart, they're probably the same people. And that's important in my mind because it means it's a cosmopolitan species that's spread across Africa. Cosmopolitan is what we are. We're the cosmopolitan primate. Soon after, soon after these Gary, Stirkfontaine, all these early homo remains, homo habilis, hominids spread. They end up in Georgia. 
Soon thereafter, they end up in Indonesia. They end up in southern China. Becoming, becoming colonizing species is a big change in Homo. And it's, it didn't happen at the beginning of Homo, but it happened soon thereafter. We look back at this now with what we know, and it all makes more sense. There's that dietary change. They become more effective hunters. They start hunting animals uh, that, that are different than uh, the other carnivores are hunting. They're not competing with other carnivores, but they are killing animals. And meat is important in the diet because it's an important source of energy. It's not that we couldn't become colonizers without it, but it should have made it easier for hominids to live in different areas. And, and that's pretty much what happened. Two and a half million years is when this begins. Something like Anna Van Arsdale did for me. Populations expanding, not marching, but populations expanding and are forming more populations and forming more populations and more populations that are related to each other, that in fact keep in contact with each other. They reticulate. But it spreads the species broadly. And if you look at this map, you can see why George is the first one outside of Africa, because for all intents and purposes, it's Africa. OK. Oh, some of these South Africans that look like on the record. Let's leave these alone. Um, the only thing I would say is that the Georgians are the same age as later Homo habilis. And in fact, when you look at the Georgians, they look like later Homo habilis. Here in the Georgian cranium, here's the latest Homo habilis skull. This is my reconstruction of Oloi 16. And I, I didn't, when I did this, these hadn't been found. So there's no influence on it, but they're similar. OK. Our ancestors. One more thing I want to talk about just for a minute is Neanderthals. I'm going to get a minute back that we got at the beginning. Because uh, I do have a couple thoughts about Neanderthals I'd like to share. One is that as long as Neanderthals were depicted like this, their place in human evolution was a real problem. And vice versa. As long as the place of Neanderthals in human evolution was a real problem, you can get away depicting them like this. But the point is you can't do that anymore because we know that Neanderthals are people. They're people in the same sense that we are people. We know this genetically, we know this anatomically, and of course, we know this from their archaeological remains and their cave paintings. And I like the idea that there's a lot of different ways of being a Neanderthal, and I also like the idea that nowadays we can actually get pictures of smiling Neanderthals. It's cute. They all don't have to look grim and awful. Or take it from Pogo, with apologies. We've met the Neanderthal, and he's us. I want to talk about this for a second. What do we mean by Neanderthals are gone? They are gone. They're extinct. But what does that mean for Neanderthals? I think that Neanderthal extinction means what James Fenmar Cooper meant about the last of the Mohegans. They, they, they were gone, right? That's what he writes about, how they all got wiped out. But they're not really extinct. They had descendants. This is normal in human populations. And I think what happened to Neanderthals is similar to this. So let me set up two possibilities. One is that Neanderthals ex are extinct like T. rex, or the other is that they're extinct like Tasmanians. The two things we know a lot about. T. rex, as we talked about early on, T. rex, it's true that T. rex is extinct. It's also true that T. rex is closely related to chickens. But T. rex here is not a direct ancestor of chickens. It's closely related to it. And in that sense, T. rex is gone, although genes it shared with other therapied dinosaurs have persisted in birds. But the, the Tasmanians are much more complicated, and that's why I have this picture of Reese Jones, a fine archaeologist who made a mistake. Uh, in his younger years, he's Welsh, in his younger years in Australia, he was part of a uh, television series on Tasmanians. And so he got on the series, and he says, yeah, but Tasmanians, well, they're all extinct now. But they used to live there, and they did this, and they did that, and they did the other thing. But then he got a, a, a deluge of letters and complaints from Tasmanians living in Tasmania who said, I'm a Tasmanian, I'm living in Tasmania, and by the way, I'm involved in a court case about land ownership because land was taken away from us and given to the Brits. And it was the court cases that brought all this to a head. They couldn't get away with it because people were Tasmanians, not just because they lived in Tasmania, but because they considered themselves Tasmanians, and they were considered as Tasmanians by their peers. Exactly the definition that we use for Native Americans. 
that's the Bureau of American Indians, uses that definition, or at least used to use it. Uh, the point is, is this is a normally recognized thing, and when you think about Tasmanians that way, then they're not really extinct, are they? Because there are people today who say I'm Tasmanians. In anatomy and culture and language, Neanderthals are gone. Tasmanians are gone, but they're both human populations with descendants in human populations today, meaning that they are among our ancestors. Ich bin stolz, ein Neanderthal zu sein. Thank you.